it's gonna be lit. It's definitely gonna be lit. It's always lit. Coming back to your hometown. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Fantrax and Basketball Monster. And today's Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast is also brought to you by Draft, a daily fantasy app where your chances of winning are almost three times better than on FanDuel or DraftKings. Download Draft now or from the App Store or go to playdraft.com and enter the promo code LOFANTASY to get yourself a 100% deposit match bonus up to $600. My name is Josh Lloyd, and as always, you can find me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We've got a lot to cover because there were 12 games under the NBA on Wednesday, and then we've got the four games from Thursday to preview. So let's get to it. To it. All right. Let's talk, uh, let's talk Monstrous Line of the Night. And um, he hasn't had it as many times this season as what he did in the, uh, in, the previous, in the previous campaign, but Steph Curry is our Monstrous Line of the Night. For Wednesday night, Steph had 39 points, which included 11 threes. He had six in the first quarter, had five boards, eight assists, three steals, and was 14 of 20 from the field. He did start off the season slowly, no, no denying that. But he's the fourth ranked player over the last month, and at the oh, he's the fourth ranked fourth ranked player over the course of the season. And at the start of the year, we had these four guys, you know, clearly head and shoulders above everyone else: Harden, Durant, Curry, and Westbrook. Now, three of those four are in the top four. We've got Yanni up there in place of Russ in that top four. But again, your punting strategy could put Russ up into that zone. So Steph, who had a few weeks where he was sort of hovering outside the top 20 or outside the top 10, he's putting it back together now. We're seeing his efficiency come back up, shooting 53% from the field over the last two weeks and 55% from three. He's averaging in those last six games 30 points, including 6.8 triples per game, five rebounds, seven assists. And one of the other things that's down with Steph this year is his steal rate. So he's actually got room to improve there. Now, I'm not saying that his usage is going to go back up. I'm not thinking that his threes are going to go back back up to where they were last year. But the steals, they can easily return to where they were last season, and that gives him an extra bump in value. So a lot of early season hand-wringing with Steph and regret, but now he's the fourth-ranked player, and you pick him at three, you pick him at two, and he comes in at four. It's not that, look, yeah, you might, oh, regret, I didn't pick Russ, I didn't pick KD. I didn't pick Jim, um, but it's not it's not the end of the world that Steph comes in ranked at number four, and he's, uh, he's definitely back in business, and this last little run of form from Steph has been very impressive, back to seeing the uh, the Steph Curry of last season. Not quite, not quite there, but, but not far away. In fact, over the last month, he is hitting more threes per game than what he did last season. He's at 5.2 per game. Last season at 5.1. So that's something that does need to sort of enter your head and go, well, he's he's back to that level. You know, I'm not quite, but, but pretty close. You, you get what I'm trying to say. All right, let's talk about today's sponsor of the show. I'll introduce you to an app which you've probably heard of. It's Draft. I know you love playing fantasy because you listen to this podcast. So I know you're going to love playing fantasy on Draft. It's a simple daily fantasy app. So it is DFS, but it's not salary cap DFS. It's snake draft DFS. So all those seasonal snake drafts that we did back in September and October, the guys of Draft have transported that into the DFS settings. So you go into the contests, you get a draft pick number, and it's a snake draft. You pick at number two, then you pick at number three if it's a head-to-head, and go back and forward and grab your players that way. It makes it... With you, it gives you a greater chance of being able to win because there's no um, formula, there's no algorithm necessarily that is going to just give you this awesome uh, lineup. You've got to use your own smarts, hopefully, which you can acquire from listening to this podcast or using our stuff over at Basketball Monster. But you know, there's no replicable way of, of being able to put the same lineup in every tournament or every every contest. So that that benefits you. You've got an th- almost three times better chance of winning on Draft than you do on FanDuel or DraftKings, and it's fun. Everyone loves doing snake drafts. It's a lot of fun, and it doesn't take long to set it up. You don't have to spend hours and hours of research. You can go in there. You can play for free. You can play for money, whatever suits you. The other good thing that listeners to this podcast get, if you go and download Draft from the App Store on Google, Google App Store or iTunes, 
go and uh, go and download it. Go to the promo code and enter L O Fantasy. You do that, and the guys at Draft will give you a 100% deposit match bonus up to 600 bucks. You put 500 dollars in, they'll give you 500 dollars on top of that, and that's uh, that's one of the best. Uh, opening account incentives that's available in the entire DFS market. I, I don't think you could argue with that. That's a that's a big amount of money. So whatever you want to put in there, you're going to get it matched on your first deposit. So go ahead to draft, support the show, find a new fun way to play DFS, and get yourself a huge deposit bonus by using that promo code L O Fantasy. It tells the guys at Draft that you came from listening to this podcast as well. And you get a big benefit out of it too. So it's a win-win. Go over to playdraft.com or search in your app stores for draft and type in that promo code LO Fantasy to get yourself up and running using the draft app and hopefully winning some cash. Let's talk waiver wire line of the night now. Frank the Tank Kaminsky. As I said the other day, that I'm uh, I'm reassessing the waiver wires and, and putting them at this point of the season to under 50% ownership. And Frank was that player. He played just 24 minutes against the Warriors, but he went at a point a minute. 24 points in those 24 minutes, two triples, seven rebounds, two assists, two steals, and he did it on nine of 14 shooting. I am a, a decent-sized fan of Frank, and I did say that I, I do expect him to be a standard league player. Maybe not this year, but, but probably next season. The player in his way is, is Marvin Wims. He played a little bit of center in this game also with Cody Zeller out and Roy Hibbert being a DMPCD, which is fine because Hibbert's terrible. No issue with Hibbert not playing at all. Frank should be used at center more. Now, he has, in these limited in, in this limited role that he had, has, over the last two weeks, he's the 101st ranked player in under 23 minutes a game. In the last month, he's just inside the top 140. So you're in a 14-team league. Frank Kaminsky's going to have value. You're in a 12-team league. You could make the argument that he's worth looking at. You probably would lose that argument, but you could you could make it, and you can definitely stream him in. The, the, as I said, the presence of Roy Hibbert, you know, although interesting to see what they do when Zeller comes back. Do they just keep Hibbert out of the lineup and play Frank as the backup center and give him 25 a night, 26 a night, and give some Spencer Hawes minutes there? Or do they just run Frank at the four? I don't exactly know what they're going to do with that, but Marvin Williams is not a massive impediment for him getting playing time in the future. As for now, he's just a 14-team league sort of a player. But let's see where it moves. And, and Dynasty Leagues... Keep it, keep an eye on him. He doesn't have massive ceiling. He doesn't have huge upside. But I think he can be better than what we've seen. And I think he can be a, a 14 and 7 guy with two triples, maybe one and a half blocks a game. Maybe one block, maybe the one and a half is going a little bit far. And being able to increase his shooting percentages, which he has done over the last month, up to 43% when he'd been down at 39 for the entire season. So he has improved his shooting, which has been one of the things that really did drop him down this season. But he's shown enough in terms of signs of improvement this year for me, Frank, that uh, that he's that he, he's looking like he could be able to assume a bigger role this season and, and most likely next season. The young gun of the night, Carl Anthony Towns. Again, let's just wrap this up. 26, 12, and 4 for Townsie. Two triples, one steal, and two blocks. He's the number three player over the last month. He's the number two player over the last two weeks. And he has been fantastic, and he has been consistently fantastic. And not much you can complain about. Over the last week, Towns is averaging 30 and 12 with four assists, 2.3 blocks. And you might say that's high. I say that that could, maybe not 30, but he could average 25, 12, and 4 over a course of a season. I fully believe that. And 2.3 blocks. These are numbers that he can easily do at some point in his career. And you know what? It might even come as early as next year. He's already averaging 23 and 12 this year with three assists and 1.6 blocks. He gets the assists to four. He gets the blocks to two, two and a half. He gets those percentages into the mid 50s and, and mid 80s, which is a possibility. You've got a top five guy there. You've got the number one player in fantasy, to be honest, over the, yeah, at some point in the next four to five years. Well, maybe Giannis has something to say about that, but but that's where Towns is going to be sitting and you're doing dynasty leagues. He's got to be a top three player. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that he has to be a top three player in dynasty leagues. He was the overwhelming number one heading into this season. I would consider Giannis in that spot, probably, but Towns is, is most likely number two and, and Davis up there as well. But another big game from Carl Anthony Towns. Let's talk dud of the night. It goes to Reggie Jackson of the Detroit Pistons. Six points for Reg, zero rebounds. 
three assists, no steals, no blocks, no triples, and he was benched down the stretch. He played only 21 minutes in this game as Ish Smith took over. He's had a couple of benchings recently in favor of Ish Smith, and that is limiting what he can do. Um, I don't think you need to be too worried about Reggie Jackson. You've got to have an appropriate level of caution, but I don't think you need to be too panicky. But this is two consecutive games where he hasn't played as many minutes as what he had before. I'll say it that way now. Van Gundy's never going to play him 34 a night. He's going to limit him. And that's why we're seeing Reggie Jackson outside the top 110 over the last two weeks. That and the fact that he's just not doing very much. He's not a very high steals guy. In fact, he's a very poor steals player at 0.7. He doesn't hit a lot of threes. He's not an aggressive rebounder. He has a grand total of two blocks for the entire season. So you're never getting contributions in those areas. But he's that steady back-end point guard and this is or not this, but what we're seeing from him recently is basically what you're going to get. I wouldn't be expecting huge improvements from Reggie Jackson, especially under a Van Gundy system. If he happens to move anywhere, which I am very, very doubtful of, I think there is absolutely no way that Reggie Jackson gets traded. It'd be interesting to see what he would do in 35 minutes a game, but those um, restrictions on his game are still there. His lack of steals, his not good three-point shooting, his no blocks, his poor rebounding, all that stuff remains. He can score, he can hit free throws, he can get assists, but he's almost like a better version of Derrick Rose at the moment. Maybe that's the best way of, of putting it. It's weird to say a better version of someone who's an MVP, but we all know where Rose sits at the moment, and that's sort of where Jackson currently is in my mind. But it's going to be an interesting scenario to watch. I'm not overly panicked about the fact that he did get benched in these last couple of games. All right, let's move on now to talk about these uh, these games in detail. There are 12 of them to get through. The first one, Indiana and Orlando. Just a horrible performance from the Magic again. And Indiana-Orlando games, whatever the opposite of must-see TV is, that's what these games are. They are just horrendous. The, uh, the Pacers get the victory 98-88, but Paul George was horrible. Eight points. For Paul George, eight points on 14 shots, three or 14 from the field with seven boards. I'll give him a pass for this one because he had been absolutely crushing it in January, and I had been very adamant that Paul George is a guy that consistently declines. So I like to give these guys props when they break patterns of what they've done in the past, and that's what he did in January. Not a great start to February for Paul, but let's uh, let's think that it's going to bounce back from there. Monte Ellis is not bouncing back. He is finished as a NBA contributor. Done. Zero points in 21 minutes, four assists on zero of three shooting. I had concerns about guys like Thad Young and Jeff Teague this season heading into the year because I thought, how are they going to be able to get the shots with Monte Ellis having as much usage as he does? Well, the turns out they just said, sorry, Monte, you're just not shooting the ball ever. And that's exactly what's happened. Monte Ellis had a usage of 9% in this game in 21 minutes. He does not shoot the ball at all. He shouldn't be owned in any leagues outside of 20-team leagues pretty much at the moment. CJ Miles was doubtful heading into the or questionable heading into the game with that knee issue. Played 21 minutes, had 16 points with four triples, and this is what he does. He got hot. He went 6 of 7 from the field. He hit four triples, and his line looks sexy. But it's CJ Miles, man. You can't trust it. It just won't continue. He'll get hurt. The shot will fall off. He's a great source of threes and blocks, uh, sorry, threes and steals when it's happening. It just doesn't happen enough. And... I mean, that's great. Stream it, add it in deepers, but don't don't expect this to be the norm moving forward. Rod Stuckey returned after a month's absence with a hamstring injury and twisted his ankle. Stuckey said that he is fine after the game, but I'll believe that when I see it. He had eight points in 14 minutes, while Little Dog had 14 and 7 in 21. Thad Young, the steals machine, kept it going. Three steals, while Miles Turner had 11 and 3 overall. Just a, a fairly ordinary night from the Pacers, despite getting the victory. For the Magic, Evan Fournier was back in the starting lineup. He played 30 minutes, 12-1-4 with two steals and two, two triples. And the thing we wanted to check is how is this going to affect guys like Abaka and Vucevic? Well, it didn't really impact them at all. Vuce played 38 minutes and went 15-15-5. Ibaka had 20-9 with a with a Richie Benno. Two for two, two, two. And if you don't know what a Richie Benno is, welcome to the program. It is two threes, it is two steals, and it is two blocks. So Serge has been very up and down this season. I think if anyone is getting traded, I think he is the out of the rumored players to get traded, he is the favorite to get traded in my mind. Out of all these other rumors, some of which are massive, massive bullshit, I think that Serge is the favorite to get moved. And well, I'll talk about it now. And that opens up things for Aaron Gordon a little bit, assuming that they would do the common sense thing and move him back to power forward. Gordon has been horrible, and 
if you're not in a position of strength in a league at the moment, you're not in the top two or top three with a bit of a buffer. You, you can't really afford to hold on to Gordon because he had, he's just not doing anything. Seven points in 32 minutes, a steal on a block. He just looks lost at times out there. The minutes were fine, but he needs an Abarca trade to actually allow him to become a top 100 player. And we're talking three weeks away from the trade deadline, two weeks of actual games until the trade deadline. If you are in that four to eight zone, jostling for playoff position, can you afford to have a guy that's a top 200 player on your roster? You might not be able to. So he can be considered expendable in certain situations. Lord Alfred Payton had 11, 6, and 3, and CJ Watson went back to the bench and had 5 points in his 19 minutes. Fittingly, Bismack Biombo had 2 points in 17 minutes. He's just not that good. Minnesota and Cleveland. Talked about Townsy already. How's Rick Rubio going? 38 minutes for Rick, 14 points, 2 rebounds, 13 assists, and 46% shooting. He's hitting shots at a decent level, which for him is magnificent. We're talking about a guy that's, you know, 38% shooter over his career and is now at over 40 over the last month. It's not much over 40, but it's a big deal. And he is averaging a shit ton of assists. We're talking almost double digit assists. He gets the steals relatively regularly and he is an integral part of what this team does. Now they lost and they got smacked by the Cavs, but that's fine. I can't see any way that Rubio gets moved. It doesn't make sense for this team. He's not... People act like he's old and past it and over the hill, and look, the guy's 25. Like he, he's not, he's still not in his actual prime in the NBA. And I really liked what I've seen from Rubio, and his fantasy value is basically right at the spot where you drafted him. Wigo had 23 points in, in true Andrew Wiggins style. He had two rebounds, zero assists, zero steals, zero blocks, but still was an efficient night from uh, from Wigo, and he does put up good numbers against Cleveland usually. Gorgie Jeng struggled. Foul trouble limited him to 21 minutes, 2-6, and six, but also the play of Shabazz Muhammad has been fantastic lately. Shabazz played 31, had 16-6 and six with a steal and two triples, and he's filling the role that a lot of people thought Nemanja Bialica would take in the preseason and cut into what Jeng would do. Didn't happen for Bialica, although Bialica had 8 points in 20 minutes here, but Muhammad is, is getting the bulk of these minutes off the bench, and he's scoring well, and he's playing well. He looks like a, a different player. He's, looks, he's less selfish. He's part uh, the... The Minnesota announcers today saw Shabazz Muhammad pass one off for an assist in transition, and they were stunned. They almost fell off their chairs. But it shows his development and maturation of, as a player, and he's looking good. He's not a guy that I'm adding in 12-teamers, but he's definitely a guy that on a low schedule night, you need some points. Shabazz is going to get you double figures most nights at the moment. Zach Levine was terrible. Eight points on 18 shots, four assists. It is a mega buy low for Zach Lowe. not... not if you can buy Zach Lowe, I don't know how much he's helping your fantasy team, but I'm sure he'd be an interesting source of info. Zach Levine, it's a massive buy low for Levine if you can get him. 8-3-4 and four is not a good output, but he can be much better than this. He's just in a massive, massive slump and needs to be attacked aggressively if you can uh, if you can try it, if you can pull it off. For the Cavs, who knows what the hell Tristan Thompson's going to do. Going from a game where he had a great opportunity against Dallas, where he was playing without Kevin Love and had, and you know, it was coming off a big game before that. He scored zero points and took zero field goal attempts. Today, 18 and 14, one steal and two blocks on seven of 11 shooting. As unpredictable as you can get, Tristan, still nothing changes though with his outlook. He's ownable in certain situations and doesn't help you in, in others. Kyle Korver had one of his better games, 20 points on 73% shooting, including four triples. I'm not rushing to grab him based on that. While well, Channing Fry started in place of Kevin Love and only played the 22 minutes. 18 points, though, three triples, four rebounds, two blocks. That's great output from Fry. I wouldn't hate owning him while Love is out. I think that he can have value with his ability to hit threes, add some blocks, and do it all relatively efficiently. Iman Shumpert did the stuff that he does. Two steals, two blocks, and three triples with seven boards. Absolutely, he has value as long as you are, are expecting a dip in field goal percentage. While well, Kyrie dished 14 assists, also took 18 shots and scored only 14 points, but 14 assists is very nice from Kyrie Irving. The next game we're going to take a look at is the New Orleans Pelicans taking on the Detroit Pistons. Anthony Davis, 
41 minutes for Tony, 31 and 12, two steals and four blocks. That is an absolute monster of a line. We know the issues with Davis, but none of those issues are production. Fantastic night. And Drew Holiday just kept it rolling. This guy is good. 22, 3 and 11 with two steals and a block. He is absolutely fulfilling my preseason expectations of him. And if you dealt with the absence at the start of the year and the slow going and the Elvin Gentry dickheadery, you're reaping the benefits now. He's putting up some absolute monster numbers. It's going to drop because he can't continue to shoot at this level, Isaiah Thomas style. But everything, he is he is a historically high efficiency shooter. He's a guy that's a great def- defender. He can pass, he can score, and he is just toasting people at the moment. Each one more had nine points. Uh, Bud Heald had five, so that little outburst that he had went back. And uh, Elvin Gentry, once again, just can't make up his mind. Went back to Terrence Jones in the starting lineup. I guess, um, as as Gentry likes to say, we, we made the move to Terrence Jones because we wanted to play a big lineup. That's their big lineup. Terrence Jones is their big lineup, apparently. As for Jonesy, this is why he's terrible. Well, he's not he's not terrible because, you know, if he was to play against me, it would be a massacre. But he's not a good NBA player. 27 minutes for Jones, 11 and 3, no other stats. Now, while he's starting, the ability for him to put up numbers is obviously increased. But it's not a given. He's not good. He's not consistent, and Gentry will get frustrated with him, and he will likely go back to the bench because he's not a good player. And that is one of the things that we always need to remember. I know I harp on it a lot, but if you're not a good real-life player, eventually your per-minute production, it's not going to matter because you're not going to be on the court enough minutes to actually turn that into any production. And that's exactly what happens with Jones. Plus, his per-minute production can be good, but it's, it's fantastic or it's terrible. It's up and down. That's the problem. Dante Cunningham went to the bench, but that shouldn't bother anybody. Tyreek Evans. 18 minutes for Tyreek. 9 points, 1 assist, no other numbers. His numbers, his minutes have somehow come down recently. They're playing just a mishmash of of Evans, of Eats One More, of Solly Hill. Langston Galloway didn't even get into the game here, of Bud Heald at the 2 and the 3. And I'm not sure that I see the path for Evans getting to 27 or 28 minutes now. I thought it was a fait accompli earlier on. He come in 15 minutes, 16 minutes. He was progressing well, putting up big stat lines, moved to 18 minutes, moved to 20 minutes, moved to 22 minutes. Play 28 minutes in one game because winning one game is more important than medical decisions. But then back to 22, back to 22. But now we're seeing it just go back down. And that's not a, I don't think that's a medical thing. I think that is a coaching thing. I think that is a, we're just not helping us enough, Tyreek. And much as I talked about with Aaron Gordon before, If you need to move on from Tyreek, I don't see the upside there as much anymore. He can still do it if he gets a 30, but he's not getting 30. I don't feel he can get to that many minutes at this point. So holding on to someone, it's a good idea early on, but at some point you've got to bite the bullet and say, well, it's not happening. Let's move on and let's try something different. Contavious Kowal Pope was massive for the Pistons. 39 minutes for Popey. 38 points, including eight triples, four boards, and four steals. He is enigmatic. He is inconsistent. But one thing he always has is the green light to shoot. And he will continue to shoot. That's what makes him always a good GPP play. Although his consistency has definitely ramped up. So he he can become decent in cash. And that's a huge performance. He's a guy that in the last month is just hovering outside the top 50. And it's not something that you would have really expected at the start of the year. Has upped his game a lot. Toby Harris had 19 and 8 in just the 28 minutes, while Andre Drummond, who normally kills the Pelicans, did not kill the Pelicans here. 17 and 6 in 26 minutes with three steals. Not not the best night for for Drummo, but it was a, a fairly comfortable victory in the end. Ish Smith, who I talked about replacing Reggie Jackson earlier, 15, 3 and 7 for Ish in those 27 minutes. He's a good deep league guy because he can get four to five assists in 20 minutes occasionally. But even if he's playing 30 minutes, he's not a must-own 12-teamer anyway, so don't get your uh, hopes up too much there. Johnny Lua, the uh, tackle box, struggled 1 of 7 for 2 points in 17 minutes with 3 assists. He has struggled to get the same minutes back and the same level of production back that he had prior to that knee injury. And in all reality, it's because he's just he's just not that good. So holding on to him is far from a, far from a, a certainty or far from something that you absolutely need to do. The New York Knicks and the Brooklyn Nets, I watched probably way too much of this game um, because it was a number of things that I wanted to check on. The the Knicks, they welcomed back uh, back Chris Stapps. 
he um, was back from his illness, and he was back in the starting lineup. Now, Porzingis battled foul trouble, but it was a pleasing sign to see him go for 19 and 12, hit a three, have two blocks in only 26 minutes. That forced Billy Hernan Gomez to the bench, and I say it in jest, but it's not in jest anymore, that when a player has a big game, that Hornacek is likely to just bench them completely, and that's that's what started to happen to Hernan Gomez. He went from the starter who put up this big 30-minute monster double-double and didn't play at all in the first quarter. He was the third center behind Noah and behind O'Quinn. Now, in the end, some common sense did come across Hornacek, and Bill had 16 and 16 in 25 minutes with two assists, two steals, and a block. But there is absolutely zero way that we can trust what Hornacek is going to do. He refused to play him in the first quarter. He was the third-string center. In the end... The two centers who played ahead of him, Joakim Noah, played 13 minutes. Kylo Quinn played 6 minutes. So that's 18 minutes in total, and they played 12 of those in the first quarter. Hornacek does not know what he's doing half the time. They did have a comeback win here against the Nets. And Billy Hernan Gomez is Ennis Cantor. That's, that's who he is. He's a, a high-efficiency, points-and-rebounds guy who gets the occasional defensive numbers, which have actually been a little bit more impressive this year than I've given him credit for. But... Is his role going to be consistent enough? We don't know that. We can't be sure of that. But it looks to be heading in that direction, so that's fine to go and add Bill. Go and grab him, see how it pans out. But don't be surprised to see a three-minute, zero-point performance. Because remember, it was two games ago in a game that went for 68 minutes that Billy Hernan Gomez played three minutes. Yes, Jeff Warnasek is a dick. No idea how to run a proper rotation. Justin Holiday. Big game for him, 28 minutes, 7, 4, and 4 with three steals and a block. It was always set up for him to be in a good spot here. And I wish they would just play him more because he, he does deserve more minutes. Um, Courtney Lee, he's back to just, no, I was going to say he's best, but he's back to Courtney Lee. 7, 4, and 2 with two steals in 28 minutes. That puts him as a deeper league guy. While Brando Jennings played 43 minutes, only the six points, and it came on one of 11 shooting. So goodbye field goal percentage. But if you added Brandon Jennings, you're, a, you're well aware of that. You know that's the issue. But he still had three boards, he had 10 assists, and he had five steals. So he helped you in the areas where you wanted help. Hopefully that's the areas you wanted help in, because that's what he's always going to produce in. As for Noah, please don't own him in 12-team leagues. He played 13 minutes and had three of seven. That's probably an indication that he's going to play 35 in the next game. Incorrectly played 35. It just continues to be a frustration. Mallow was terrible as well. Six of 22 for 15 points and went without um, a rebound in the entire first half. Onto the Nets. They made a change to their starting lineup, and Big Bad Rondé Hollis-Jefferson started. Big Bad Rondé Hollis-Jefferson, BBRHJ, played 30 minutes. 16, 8, and 3 with a block on 55% shooting and 100% from the line. I was pretty excited about Hollis-Jefferson this season. I recognized that he had deficiencies, and I recognized that he had a lot of potential. And I thought that the Nets would come out and play him 30 minutes, because they have no young talent at all. They haven't done that so far. Now, he's been battling ankle soreness all year, which is understandable. You break your ankle, that shit's going to last a long time. But this is a a good sign to see him move into the starting lineup, and it doesn't sound temporary. Kenny Atkinson was saying, yeah, Rondé's earned this role. He's earned this bigger bigger role. And is he a must-own guy? No, but probably the last month or two months... We've seen, per minute-wise, Hollis Jefferson putting up numbers that would say, if this guy gets 30 minutes, he's going to be a player worth owning. I don't have full faith that he's going to get 30, but I think he could get 27 or 28. But it's definitely a step in the right direction. So if you want to get in early, especially if you're lacking in steals, yes, he had no steals here, but if you're lacking in steals and want to get some rebounds, that's where Hollis Jefferson's going to thrive. So go and have a look and see if he's around. Karis LeVert, the uh, the internet's reach-around favorite. I'm a big Karis Levert fan. You know that. You probably, I'm probably, could I be his biggest fan? I've been his, I've been a huge fan of Levert for a very long time. But there's a lot of wankery going on about him. Um, he, he was good. 27 minutes for Levert, 10, 4, and 2, two triples and two steals. Good numbers. He, he can definitely, if he gets 30 plus minutes, he's, it's a no-brainer to me that he's a must-own player in that scenario. I just don't know if I have faith in him, A, getting to 30 minutes, and then B, not sitting games and resting games here because we've already seen him miss a couple of games and when you're a borderline guy resting two, three, four games down the stretch almost takes you out of consideration 
there's almost no way that if you, I've seen people who send me teams and they are holding Hernan Gomez, they've got Zubats and they've got Levert. You can't afford three type of lottery ticket guys like that. The pattern from Kenny Atkinson this season has been that no one's getting 30 minutes unless your name's Brook Lopez. So to think that Levert's going to get there, I'm a little bit doubtful of it. I'm pretty confident he's staying in this 26 minute role. But I'm not. I'm not suggesting that he's an absolute must-own guy. But his fantasy skill set is brilliant. You know I love it. You know I think he can easily be a top 100 guy in the proper role. It's more about is he getting this proper role, and what are the what's the likelihood of him getting this proper role? And Joe Harris played nine minutes. Randy Foy played 17 minutes. Jeremy Lin still has to come back, and that's going to cut some playing time out of, out of some of these guards as well. So you, we, we've got. We've got a guy that's a really good producer, but he's got he's got a cap on him. He's got just a hand on his head, just holding him back, just slightly. And it could it could definitely be released, but it, again, it all comes back to where are you in the standings? How long can you afford this? Can you afford four weeks of a guy that's the hundred and seventieth best player? Maybe, maybe not. You're in first, sure. You're in sixth. Yeah, I don't think so. But I. This is not me saying I don't like Harris Lewis because I do. I really like him. You know I like him. But there's just a little bit of overhype on him. Brookie Lopez played 31. Wasn't a great Lopez night. 10 and 6 in those 31 minutes. And they made a change at point guard. The Nets. Isaiah Whitehead started. Was terrible. 4-4-4. Four, four, and, four, and Spencer Dinwiddie wasn't much better. 3-2-2. Three, two, and two. No reason to consider any of those guys in uh, probably even 14 team leagues at the moment, to be honest. The Atlanta Hawks and the Miami Heat blowout. This is uh, There were so many blowouts. On Wednesday, Tabo was out, so Timmy Hardaway started. He had 10-4-2 in 26 minutes. Realistically, looking at this Hawks box score, there's nothing of, of note to gain because because it was such a smashing. We saw DeAndre Bembry play 22 minutes. Like That's that's the level we're at. Dennis Schroeder saw only 26. Paul Millsap played 24. They just got their pants pulled down. <coughs> And yeah, analyzing too much out of it's not going to be uh, not going to be productive. It was a good night from Kent Bazemore though, who had 14 points with two steals and a block. So a good a good Bazemore night, which is happening a little bit more often now, and he absolutely can be owned in 12 team leagues. I still don't think he's a good player, but his value has definitely stabilized. For the Heat, they win another one. That is eight in a row, nine in a row, nine in a row for the Heat. Jesus, um, Jimmy Johnson. Only played 23 minutes because he uh, he came flying in to uh, to throw just throw a few on uh, on Torian Prince after he decked Hassan Whiteside and got himself ejected. He is the player in the NBA that you would not want to fight. He is the toughest bastard in the entire league, and there are a lot of uh, fake tough guys in the NBA. There are a lot of hold me back type of players. James Johnson's not a hold me back type of player. He will he will lay you out. He he's he is a fair. He's a fair player. He's not a dirty player, but he is he is ridiculously tough. And he's ridiculously productive. 16, 2, and 3. One steal, three blocks, two triples has to be owned. This was in 23 minutes. A must-own player. No doubt about it. Dion Waiters, what the hell's going on here? 20.7 rebounds, three assists. And Dion also had a Richie Benno. Two for two, two, two. He did see his minutes reduced with Tyler Johnson back to 32. He played under 30 minutes. And he did this on... 60% shooting, which is not realistic for Dion. When Joshy Richardson comes back, he is going to come back down to 27, 28 minutes. He's not going to be able to maintain 30 minutes of playing time. Yes, Scooter Magruder is going to lose a lot of that. Yes, Wayne Ellington is going to lose a lot. But Waiters is going to lose shot attempts. He's going to lose some playing time as well. And he's not going to continue to shoot at this level. But with the way he's going, why wouldn't you own him? You've got to watch your field goal percentage because he can kill it. He can kill your free throw percentage as well. So those things are concerns, and you do have to look at them. But he is just playing so well at the moment that it is, it's defying logic, to be honest. Goran Dragic, 27 points with five assists and five rebounds, and Whiteside with a big one, 18 and 18, with two blocks. Good to see Tyler Johnson back, 11, 3, and 5, two steals, two blocks for Tyler in 32 minutes. He was a comfortable top 100 guy before the injury. No problem considering him going back to that zone now. I think he's going to be a top 100 player again. Toronto and Boston. Kyle Lowry. 
Huge night from Lowry, 38 minutes, 32 points, and it comes on 60% shooting, which is ridiculous. He hit four triples, had five assists and two steals. Now, I spent a lot of time in December, I believe, talking about Kyle Lowry regression, and, and it's come. He was like the number three player through December. He's 19th over the last month, and that's what I meant when I talked re regression, that he's going to go from being a player that's a top three guy or a top five guy back to that guy that's at the end of the middle to end of the second round. And that's still a really good player. He's still shooting stupid numbers, like 7% above his true shooting from last season, hitting threes at a much elevated rate. And it can get worse. He can regress. But this is what I meant by regression, and these nights are fine. Good stuff from Lowry. There was no DeMar DeRozan again. Um, the Raptors on a back-to-back -back after overtime. They got beaten by the Celtics. Norm Powell started. He was good again. 12-5-2 in 32 minutes. But you know that Dwayne Case is going to bury him on the bench in the next game when DeRozan returns. While well, Damari Carroll played 38 minutes. Unsurprisingly, he was bad. 6-6 six and six with two triples. I would rather have Kent Bazemore than Damari Carroll on my fantasy team at that point. So that's how, that's how you know where it's at. 12 minutes for Jonas Valanciunas, not a good night. He did battle foul trouble, 3-3 three and three in that time, so it wouldn't be too overly concerned about a poor performance. While Bebe stepped into the uh, breach, 10-5 and five with a steal and four blocks for Nogueira. In 28 minutes, Bebe is absolutely someone that's fine to own. Um, you, you know what he's going to bring you. It's blocks, it's field goal percentage. He helps in very specific areas, maybe like a Tristan Thompson type, but he's got enough value to own. Jared Salinger, who had barely played, he got 16 minutes and scored 13 points with six rebounds. I wouldn't be taking this as a sign of like, all right, Jared Solander's is back. We're going to start starting him. I think it's a, a case of, Jared, we're going to do you a favor. We're just going to put you in, play against your former team in your former home arena and, um, and see what you can do. He played well and he got a few extra minutes. I wouldn't think that it's something that's going to stick or going to have any impact in fantasy moving forward. Pat Pat only saw 21 minutes, and he, as we know, is nowhere near a fantasy contributor. For the Celtics, I don't want to get wrapped up too much in talking about Isaiah Thomas, but it's just ridiculous. 38 minutes for Isaiah, 44 points, 5 triples, 7 assists, 55% shooting, 15 of 16 from the free throw line. As I continue to state, the numbers that he is putting up, 34% usage in the last two months. 66% true shooting in the last two months has been achieved by exactly zero players. Or, zero, or, or Sorry, let's phrase, rephrase that. It's been achieved by exactly zero players who have played more than 10 minutes total in a season. Zero. Not LeBron, not Kevin Durant, not Shaq, not Hakeem, not David Robinson, not Michael Jordan, Isaiah Thomas. And that is why I continue to believe that he has been fantastic it defies all manner of logic and physics, what he's doing, but I continue to believe that it will regress. And it won't regress far, but it, it will regress Kyle Lowry style to being the guy that's number, instead of him being number two, where he currently is in the last month or two, which is just ridiculous, he'll come back to being 15. He'll come back to being 20 or so, maybe. That, that's how I see it. If he continues to do it, you almost have to say you're the MVP. I don't think no, that's not true because I think Jim Harden is, but because yeah, he, he's just so piss poor on defense. You can talk about Harden being poor on defense. Thomas is another level. But what he's doing shot making wise is extraordinary. It's unprecedented. And I still don't believe that it will continue. He continues to make me look stupid, and I'm sure Celtics fans will, uh, will love that I continue to say that I don't think it'll continue because it seems to make him continue. But at some point, it is going to dip, and I remain committed to the uh, to the mathematical science of regression. Marcus Smart, he started the second half over Jalen Brown and had a good Marcus Smart line, 10-5-5 five five with two steals in those 35 minutes. He's an absolute staple in a punt field goal percentage situation. While Jay Crowder didn't hit multiple threes, which comes as a bit of a shock, 14-8 and eight for Jay in 34 minutes. Al Horford struggled immensely didn't score for big chunks of this game to begin with. Ended up with 11, 3, and 6 in 32 minutes, while Amir Johnson replaced Jonas Shirepko because uh, because uh, Brad Stevens wanted to match up against the big the big Toronto front court of Patrick Patterson and Jonas Valanciunas, that big bruising front court. He played 14 minutes, Amir. Jonas Shirepko played 19 off the bench. Also, Brad Stevens, in his pregame quotes 
was like, yeah, I want to I want to put Amir into the starting lineup to match up against the big front court, and I like the way that Kalia Linick and Jonas Sherepko work together off the bench. Literally two minutes after that, after that press conference, a tweet came out: Kalia Linick is not playing. So he's either lying or there's just a complete lack of communication in the Celtics situation. He's out there. No, I really can't wait to see Olenek and Yurepko running that second unit as the big man and tearing them apart. And then Cali did not play with a shoulder issue. So that was uh, that was intriguing. The Philadelphia 76ers and the Dallas Mavericks. The Sixers, they can withstand the loss of Joel Embiid. They can't withstand the loss of Bob Cuff. They got spanked by the Mavericks. Another blowout. Not not really much to, to talk about here, except that Timotei Lawawu Cabrero made his first NBA start. He wasn't great, but he was good. 23 minutes for Lawawu Cabrero, 7 points, 4 rebounds, and 2 assists. You know that I'm very high on Lawawu Cabrero, and it was good to see him. It's good to see his progression from a guy that was a D-League player uh, early this season to being out of the rotation, to being in the rotation, to causing Hollis Thompson to get cut, to seeing his minutes rise, and now a progression to being a starter. Really good improvement. Love the way he moves. He is going to be a good player. I am I am almost convinced of it. He is not going to be a fantasy contributor this season, but he is one for the deeper leagues. Now, they started Jaleel Okafor over New Orleans. Now, that should probably never happen again. 16 points on 16 shots for Jaleel. One rebound, no steals, no blocks, and Salah Mejri was able to go off. Now, New Orleans Noel wasn't great himself. He had 8-3 and three in his 17 minutes with a steal, but at least he was efficient. At least he grabbed more than one rebound. And Okafor was just really, really poor. Sharich had 10-7. and seven. Wasn't a great night for him, but Ursan Ilyasovan had a nice double-double. He was the one grabbing all the boards. 13-10 and 10 in 31 minutes. Also a good good performance from Chason. Chason? 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 Randall. 12 minutes for Randall, 8, 2, and 2 with a triple one. Good performance from him. He's obviously going to find it tough to get minutes when Ben Simmons returns. But for now, he's showing that he deserves a look in the NBA at least. For the Mavs, Seth Curry was fantastic again. 22, 3, and 6 with four steals for Steph in th- and three triples. Of course, you have to own him now while Darren Williams and JJ Barea is out. He's going to find it a little bit harder to do exactly what he's doing now later on, but it's great for now. And Yogi Ferrell made his third consecutive start. Played 38 minutes. It wasn't a great Yogi Ferrell night. He went 3 of 13 for 11, 3 and 5 with a steal and a block. And his value is obviously going to evaporate to pretty much nothing once Darren Williams returns, but it's going to be enough to secure him a two-year deal from Dallas. So good stuff from Yogi Ferrell. Wes Matthews and Dirk both stunk. The pencil had 15 and 7 in 32 minutes. And I've got to talk Salah Mejri, who played 21 minutes. Now, I'm a decent Salah Mejri fan. He's always shown that he can produce when he's given minutes, and he did. 16 and 17 with a steal and a block in only 21 minutes. And that meant that Dwight Powell played only 10. And this is the issue with Dwight. I mentioned this the other day, because he had a big game the last time the Mavericks played. Dwight Powell put up a big line, and people get very excited. Every time that Dirk goes down or Bogut goes down, oh, do we go and grab Dwight Powell? Yeah. Maybe, but Carlo doesn't like him. Carlo refuses to use him on a consistent basis. And we saw that here as he played 10 minutes and had 6 and 3. He still had a triple 1. It was a nice production from Dwight. But Mejri got the bulk of the minutes. And that's going to be what limits Dwight moving forward is, is Carlisle's uncertainty with using him in the rotation. Memphis and Denver, another smashing. The Grizzlies uh, took, took control of this one pretty comfortably, so there's not a lot to really report on. But I want to talk Chandler Parsons for a second. Another 22 minutes for Parsons, 6-6-3. Six, six, and three. I, I just don't see him getting more than 25 minutes before the All-Star break, and it just seems like he's going to be completely limited for you know, big chunks of this season. Like we talked about with Aaron Gordon before, you know, holding on to Chandler... I don't really see the benefit in it. Tyreek Evans, same thing. Like I just think he's going to be stuck in this role for the next couple of weeks. Not much else to really report on with this game. Again, it, it was a blowout, so minutes were limited all over the place. That, also, shout out to Memphis for this one being a blowout, and you, and you limit Mike Conley. But in the other the game the other day against the Suns, when you were blowing them out, Conley played as many minutes as possible, scored a bazillion points, and uh, knocked me out of first place in the GPP. So shout out to uh, Fisdale for that one. Onto the Nuggets. No Jokic, no Farton, Will Barton. 
Jameer Nelson got ejected three minutes into the game, and the Rooster didn't let Gallinari strain his groin, so they got smashed. Ken Fareed was great, 11 and 11. He does this on such high percentage shooting that when it doesn't go in at 83%, you do worry, but he's fine to be owned for now. It'll be interesting to see what goes on. Once Jokic comes back, it is going to limit what Fareed can do, but as long as he stays remain, remaining starting next to Jokic, it's fine. Gaz Harris was solid 12 in 25 minutes, while Jamal Murray had to play a lot. 9, 4, and 2 with 3 steals for Jamal in 32 minutes, while Manny Moutier returned from his back injury-induced absence. He had a minutes limit of 20, played 26 minutes with the ejection of Jameer. 14, 6, and 7 for Manny. You're punting field goals? Own him. Go and grab him. Go back and get him. Fine. I, I would hope that, that would give him 25-plus you know, minutes moving forward, hopefully up to 30. Get some of those assists. He can score occasionally. Get some steals, and you don't have to worry about the field goal issue that he does. Uh, that he does provide. If the rooster happens to be out, I think Wancho and Wilson Chandler are going to be the big beneficiaries. Chandler should be owned in all leagues, but Wancho. Let's see what happens with the rooster. But Wancho is that guy in deeper leagues you want to look at. Maybe even 16 teamers, depending on uh, how your situation looks. Let's move on to Milwaukee and Utah. Brogo, 31 minutes for Malcolm Brogdon. 10, 3, and 4 with 3 steals and 2 triples. A huge performance. Love Brogdon. Just there's no certainty with him at all. Another smashing, another blowout. The Jazz get the victory over the Bucks here. Really hard to know what to make of Brogdon. Will he play 23? Will he play 32? Because it's Jason Kidd who, again, I do remind you, he's a horrible coach. He's a very, very, very bad coach. Good performance from Brogdon, though. No problem still holding on to him, but it is a tenuous situation. 32 minutes for Jabari, 17 and 7. And Giannis was poor, man. Nine points in 39 minutes, six rebounds, four assists on two of 10 shooting. From the very first minute of the game, yeah, some of their beat reporters were like, what the hell's going on with Giannis? He just looks out of it. So I don't know what was going on there. Matty Della Vadova, 26 minutes, five points with seven assists. In that sort of role, there's not much point in owning him. And Tone Snell went back to 22. That's fine. That's probably too much for Tone Snell, but 30 minutes is way too much. Don't need that from him. Now, the report is, again, of Chris Middleton potentially returning just before the All-Star break. So everybody is getting real excited about that. Very, very interested in Chris Middleton returning. But a good analogy that someone brought up, and I don't remember who it was that brought it up, but whoever it was, I give you kudos for bringing this to my attention. It's very reminiscent of the Paul George injury situation. Around this time, two years ago, Paul George is coming back. He's going to be back before the end of the season. And everyone was like, let's grab him, let's grab him, let's grab him. And he was terrible. He'd missed the whole chunk of the season, and they eased him back into things, and he was bad. Now, Middleton's going to return a little bit earlier than Paul George, it looks like. But adding someone who is going to be a zero for at least two weeks and then is going to be almost a virtual zero for probably four weeks after that, how's that going to help you? If you want to take a punt on it and you're in a position of power, do it. But remember, we're talking about playoffs starting in four weeks most of the time. Is Chris Middleton going to be at 30 minutes in four weeks' time? I would say 95% chance the answer to that is no. Will he be at 30 minutes in six weeks' time? 85% chance the answer to that is no. Will he stick at 24 or so minutes? Yes. Will that be enough? Probably not. Now, in dynasty formats, I think he goes back to being a top 30 guy next year. That doesn't bother me. But this year, we're talking about a guy that's been out of action for six months and de dealing with a significant hamstring injury. And I just don't think that he is going to come in and play 35 a night and be the same Chris Middleton. He is fantastic. I love Chris Middleton. But you've got to look at it from a realistic point of view. Can you afford a an unownable player for six weeks? If I want to be kind, let's say for four weeks, can you afford that? In a lot of cases, the vast majority, the answer is going to be no. Thon Maker made another start at center. 12 points with three triples and three blocks for Thon. Great stuff. He played 24 minutes. Miles Plumley out of the rotation. John Henson, out of the rotation, which is fine because they're terrible. I, I can see Thon sticking as the starter if we had a coach who had any sort of ability to stick to the courage of his convictions. Unfortunately, Jason Kidd is not that man. He has no ability to plan things for the future, to stick with anything beyond three games out. 
But Maker's showing some talent. He's a better fantasy prospect than Plumley by a significant margin. He's probably a better fantasy prospect than Henson because he can hit threes. Interested. 16-teamers, go ahead. I put him behind Bill Hernan Gomez. I put him behind Ivica Zubats at this point. But he's, he's in that zone of guys that, let's have a look at him. Let's see where it's going. It's a very positive uh, positive move here. Now, with him playing 24 minutes, Greggy Munro played 24, 13 and 3 for two steals and with Munro. Munro has been great this season, still has been underused, and I would like to see him getting 30 minutes a night, even if that is at the expense of Thon. But if this team continues to slide, then I'd have no problem with them ramping it up and giving Thon 27 a night to see how that goes down. It's going to be an interesting uh, situation in Milwaukee. Also, shout out to Jason Terry for still getting 17 minutes a night in the year 2017. For the Utah Jazz, Rudy Gobert crushing it offensively. 26 and 15 with a steal and a block for Rudy. He has been a top 20 player over the last week or so. The thing you need to be aware of with Rudy, though, we can talk as much as we want. Oh, he's improved his free throws. He's still a punt free throw guy, I believe. He's shooting 66%, but it's coming on over six attempts a game. And whenever I see a, a Z score as negative two or larger, that's pretty much punt. Because in order to get it back to average, you need to have someone that's very good in that category just to bring it to average. And then you have to make sure you've got no other negative guys and a bunch of other good guys to make that category a position of strength for you. Easy enough to bring it back to average, but what's the point of being average? So it's a coin flip every week. You want to have some position of strength there. So Gobert is good. He's been fantastic. But don't act like that because he's a 66% shooter now that he is not a punt free throw guy because the volume is really big. And in a lot of cases, you won't be able to cover it perfectly. Rod Hood, Rocket Rodney. Um, yeah, hyperextended knee for Rocket. It's eight minutes, three points. Go ahead and cut him. They said that there's no, they don't see there's being any significant injury, any significant structural damage, but they are going to have an MRI on it, but he's going to have to miss time. Almost a guarantee for Rocket that he's going to have to miss some time. So that's going to push Joey Johnson and Joe Ingles back into consideration. Now, Ingles had three points in 23 minutes, but dished five assists and had three steals. Probably a 14 team league guy. Joey Johnson with Derek Favors out had 14, 6, and 5. Looks great. As long as Favors is out, I'm okay with grabbing Johnson. But I don't know how long Favors is going to be out. Now, Favors is another one in this group of guys. Aaron Gordon, Tyreek Evans, Chandler Parsons, Rocket. Yeah, just move on from him. Uh, in, in most cases, you know, hold, it's, it's, not a, it's not a blanket. And that's that's one of the good things about fantasy basketball as well is it's not, it's not black and white. There's no absolutes. There's no... This guy, and I get this question all the time, who's a must start? Who's a must roster? Who's a must own? No one, really. is. The answer is is generally no one, unless they're, well, in DFS, there's never anyone that's a must start guy, really. But there's no, this guy is must own, because there's so many different factors associated with it. So when we look at all these different factors, is Derek Favors someone that's a must own? No, because no one is. But is he someone that I would consider dropping, depending on the circumstances? Yes. He's not a player that I wouldn't consider dropping. And that's that. That's a that, that's an important distinction. I I was hopeful he could get to 30 minutes a night, but what we've seen over the last two weeks, he is going backwards as well. The coach's faith in him is going backwards, and it's just not going to get there, it feels like. When you can see constant progress and a nice pattern of moving forward, you get hyped up. Well, not hyped up. You go, okay, this is good. This is working the way I think it's going to work. He's just getting the couple more minutes. The production's starting to come. The field goal shooting's coming back. But then when it goes backwards and the minutes don't increase, like Tyreek, like the production of Aaron Gordon, like Chandler Parsons, you go, well, maybe this is just it. Maybe this is it for the season. And that's how I'm feeling with Derek Favors at the moment. The Clippers and the Phoenix Suns, DeAndre Jordan, Ejected. A lot of ejections happening on Wednesday. 6-12 and 12 for Jordan with two steals and four blocks. Probably the best news, though, for the Clippers was Blakey Griffin playing 34. He went 29-8-5 and five and had a steal and a block, and it's safe to say that he's back in business. Austin Rivers dealt with, dealt with some foul trouble, only had 28 minutes, 14-2-4 with three steals. Still should be owned in most cases, while that meant that Ray Felton could get some more action. 30 minutes for Ray, 18-5 and five with an assist. I don't think that Ray Felton is a 12-team league guy. He also got some extra run in this one because Luke Marmute has now played under 20 minutes for three straight games. Now, he dealt with foul trouble in this game too, just the 13 minutes, but we're seeing his minutes come down and they're playing a little bit more you know, Felton, Reddick, Crawford, 
or Rivers, Reddick, Reddick Crawford, and less Ma Mute as he was playing the four before, but now he's he's not playing as many minutes there. So that is something to watch with Felton, but I don't think he's a 12-team league guy. Jamal Crawford had 14 points with five assists, a steal and a block, so a good night from Jamal, but we know that he's a long way from being a, being an ownable player in most standard formats. For the Suns, Eric Bledsoe scored 40 points for the third time in the last week, equaled his career high with 41 and had four rebounds and eight assists and did it on 59% shooting. He has been fantastic this season and really rewarding people who put some faith in him. Speaking of putting faith in people, TJ Warren, he joins that list, man. Just move on. They're just not going to continue to give him minutes. Yes, PJ Tucker may get traded. He might, but I, I think that Warren's value is so tied to Bledsoe rather than Tucker. He's still playing 29 minutes. He just doesn't take any shots anymore. He's just a decoy half the time. He's not engaged defensively. It just feels like it's completely tied to Bledsoe. When Bledsoe goes out of the games or has a limited game with foul trouble or whatever, then Warren has a big one. And that's how it doesn't feel like a Tucker issue. Yes, Tucker played 34 minutes and had 10 and 14 with a big night. But the Warren issue feels more like a Bledsoe problem. Alex Len played six minutes. No point in holding on to him. Tyson Chandler, 11 and 4. But Marquise Chris, another big night for Marquise Chris. 9, 5, and 1 with four steals. Didn't shoot well with 3 and 15. Still has a lot of issues. But as I've said plenty of times with him, if he gets enough minutes, he's going to be a fantasy contributor. Is he a guy to add in 12 teamers? It might be a little bit aggressive to grab him now, but I don't completely hate it. The thing about him is that the foul trouble is going to be the problem, and that's going to limit him. And I'm not convinced that he's over that issue, so that's what probably turns him away from being a 12-team guy. But just a quick shout-out to Earl Watson, who I believe is just a ridiculous coach. He he said that one of the things that, that people had wrong about Marquise Chris was he has an exceptional, exceptionally high basketball IQ. Everybody that I've ever spoken to about Marquise Chris has got the dude has got so many physical talents, but he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know how to play basketball. He is lost every time he's out there on the court. So if Earl Watson truly believes that, like you can, you can, you can say that as a way to pump up a guy, but you also don't need to say it. You can just say, man, he's got such athletic gifts. He's really showing so much effort and look at how hard he is to contain when he gets on the bounce and moving around and defensively, he's a you know, really intimidator. But don't say shit that just seems completely in the face of everything that anyone's ever said about this guy. Earl Watson just, he, is, uh, he struggles in a big way. Devin Booker had another 20-point performance, backed it up with four rebounds and six assists, but the efficiency is suffering a little bit recently. Seven of 19 for Devin in this one. Let's talk about the Chicago Bulls and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Jim Butler, 28-4-5 with three steals in under 30 minutes. Another blowout performance here. This was a, a weird sort of game. Um, as weird as it was, this is how you can get, gather that it was weird. Isaiah Cannon and Michael Carter-Williams both played. That's how much of a blowout it was. Dougie McDermott only played 14 minutes. Taj Gibson had 8-8. Eight and eight. This was a good Jaron Grant game, though. 12 points for Jaron in 22 minutes. No, 22, 26 minutes, sorry. Three rebounds, three assists, but it came on five of seven shooting. That's not realistic for Jaron, so he got the extra, he got the shots to go in, so he got extra minutes and he produced. That stuff is not going to happen. Do not buy into this. Do not get excited by this from Jaron. Paul Zipser with another 24 minute night, seven, five, and two. He's very far from being a 12 team league guy, like extremely far, but he's consistent. He hits threes, maybe one a game, but he's enough for like a 20 team league that you go, this guy's got a 24-minute roll, and he's giving me consistent production every game. And that's sort of where we're at with uh, with Zip Sanity. For the Thunder, Russ had 28, 5, and 8 with two steals, a block, and two triples. And I talked about this yesterday, maybe the day before, that Billy Donovan is still not sure. He said, we're going to have to take a few games to get used to how we're going to run this rotation with Ennis Cantor out, and that's exactly what happened. DeMontis Sabonis, who came off a double-double in 35 minutes, played 22 minutes and went 2-5 and five on 1 of 10 shooting. It was Jeremy Grant who picked up the slack. He had 15 points in 20 minutes, and Joffrey Laverne had 4 in 14. So Sabonis is fine to grab, but it's going to be up and down. He's not going to be a consistent, great performer, and that spot is probably going to be better used 
as a streaming position. Oladipo only played the 25 minutes. He had some uh, foul trouble here, but campaign got 19, dished five assists. I like Payne for 16 teamers. He can give you those assists, and as I've said a, a lot of times, just watch him. If he gets to 24 or 25 minutes, he's going to be able to push 12-team league value. Also, this game was such a blowout that Josh Hustis played for the first time for the entire season. Seven points for Hustis in seven minutes. Pick up Josh Hustis. Run, don't walk. The Charlotte Hornets and the Golden State Warriors. Just to round out the night, another blowout. Marco Bellinelli had 16 points with seven assists. A good Bellinelli night. With him playing with Jeremy Lamb back, we saw Michael Kidd-Gilchrist reduced to 23 minutes. That's under 25 for two consecutive games for Kidd-Gilchrist. This was always the likelihood of happening, and now it is happening. So if you did add Kidd-Gilchrist, you can probably move on fairly safely. A good night from Marv Williams, 14-5 and five with two triples, while Batum had 13-5-7. and seven. Kemba Walker was not good, seven points in 25 minutes. He took just five shots. Yuck. For the Warriors, Clay, 29, 5, and 8. Getting 8 assists out of Clay Thompson is as big a bonus as you'll get. And he hit 6 triples, or Draymond blocked 4 shots and had 10 boards. And Durant had 18, 8, and 8. JaVale McGee started with Zaza out, 9 and 4 with 4 blocks. I legitimately got the question, do we go and pick up JaVale for 12, 10 leagues? The answer is no. Um, he's going to be in this limited role. But if you need blocks, tomorrow, 4 games on, JaVale playing... Add him. Add him for that. He's not a guy that you go, yes, I'm just holding him until Zaza comes back, man. I'm just riding JaVale. It's a, it's a case of, I need blocks. Do I need blocks tomorrow? Yeah, sure. JaVale, let's go. Let's get a couple and move on. He's not playing 26 minutes a night. He's not playing 20 minutes a night, most likely. He's playing 16 minutes a night. They'll run through their plethora of backup bigs, Damian Jones, James McAdoo, Kavon Looney, Andy Varajal. They've got like five centers on this team. None of them are good. JaVale's the best of them, excluding Zaza. But they're going to give these other guys a run. But he can obviously be used to stream through for block numbers. That does it for the games from Wednesday. There was a lot to get through there, obviously. I'm going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be back to preview all the action that we've got coming up on Thursday. Perfect DFS lineups from Wednesday. On FanDuel, Isaiah Thomas, 56.3, and Steph Curry with 62. Kentavious Caldwell-Pope, 50.3, and Clay Thompson at 50. At small forward, LeBronald at 58.6, and Vince Carter at 31. And the power forward, Serge Ibaka, 40.3, Frank Kaminsky, 39.4. And at center, of course, everybody's must-own player, Salah Mejri, 39.4, for a total of 427.3, and that costs $59,600. On DraftKings, Steph had 68.25, Caldwell Pope had 55.5, LeBron 62, Griffin 50, Bill Hernan Gomez 46, Clay at 53.75, Kaminsky at 40.75, and Mejri at 42.25 for a total of 418.5, and that was 49,500. Good luck to anybody having any of those lineups. If you had both Kaminsky and Mejri, and on Fangio and Vince Carter in that lineup, you um you are from the future. Let's go on to these games. So there are four only. So we're looking at you know, probably not as great of a night in DFS as we had today. Obviously, the scores won't be as high. Let's talk about the first game. We're looking at the Los Angeles Lakers and the Washington Wizards. The Wizards are favored. And just by the way, all of these games could potentially be blowouts. So that's going to really make it a very interesting or tough night in DFS. The Wizards are favored by 11 and a half. And the total is 218.5. We need to check on the status of Julius Randle, who's still dealing with pneumonia. If he happens to be out, it boosts... If it's a Zubats, it boosts Tariq Black. They're the two guys who get the biggest increase in value there. Let's talk point guards. It's Johnny Wall. It's D'Angelo Russell. Johnny's up to 10,800. But on a slate like this, 
you know, no problem with using him. There aren't that many high-priced players around. Yes, there's him, there's Jimmy Harden, and there's Steph and KD. They're your sort of high-priced four guys. But John Wall is fine at that at that price, especially going up against a Lakers team, which we know yields some pretty big numbers to point guards. He's at 10-4 on DraftKings, but I would say it's a blowout risk, which it is. But the lowest spread in any of these games is 8.5, and, and that's the Warriors against the Clippers. And the last time they met, the Warriors won by 40-plus. So no game is immune from blowout risk in this one. So playing in cash is going to be really hard on this slate. Like not, not easy at all. As for D'Angelo Russell, he's at 6,100. Brilliant game in the last one where he put up 47 points. You know that I'm a big Russell fan. He's at 5,700 on DraftKings. The matchup against the Wizards is not ideal. John Wall's a fairly good defender, and they do reduce what point guards can do output-wise. But Russell's fine. Again, there's not many good options around especially if you're looking to save some cash at point guard. There just really isn't many mid-price guys who are, in a, who are in a brilliant situation. This is not a brilliant situation, but it's fine to consider it. Jordy Clarkson's going to be a tough one to use. You could take a punt on a GPP, but with, uh, with Russell back, it's hard to see Clarko getting 34 or 35 a night, which is probably what he needs given the way that he's been producing. Bradley Beal at 7,200. I like that. You should be, should be feeling pretty good about Brattles getting 30 plus he's at 7000 on draftkings no worries he's he's got he's definitely got value uh, at that spot uncle p had a nice 32 point performance for the lakers against the nuggets he's at 4300 you definitely don't want to trust him in cash the matchup is a massive negative for him so he is a, somewhat of a no go whereas lou williams had a good one in the last game but it came on very very high percentage shooting it was a 41-point performance, but his salary is at 6500 So how much faith do we have in a game where he's probably likely to see only 24 minutes? Do we think that Lou can get to 30? I, I, I don't. At 5700 on DraftKings, I think that he's a decent GPP player, but I just don't feel that that's anywhere good enough for cash, especially that $6,500 price. 35, not 35, I don't know what I'm talking about. Let's talk small forwards. Kelly Oubre, he's at 3800 He's been getting solid minutes. He's averaging 27 over the last five. Now, he's not producing big numbers, but you want to produce big numbers. You play the Lakers. That's that's the way it goes. He's at 34 on DraftKings. He's got a real chance to exceed 20 points here, which on a day like this, if you want to get some of these studs in or multiple studs in, you're going to have to find a player who's a minimum type salary player who's got the ability to exceed value or get at least close to it to fit these guys in. And Ubre is one of those guys that fits that mold with this matchup really helping him. The other small forward for the Wizards, Otto Porter, is just priced so high. 6,700 on Fangio, 6,500 on DraftKings. He can produce. He just doesn't touch the ball enough. And now that he's sort of laboring with that hip problem, I don't feel confident in Otto. He can go off if they give him the ball. They just haven't been giving him the ball enough to really make it a worthwhile investment. Lou Deng, I don't see how we can really consider using him and same with Brando Ingram, who is averaging just seven points over the last three games. At Power Forward, we've got another one of those cheap guys that we can have a look at. Jason Smith is a 3,500 minimum salary player and 3,000 minimum salary on DraftKings guy who is averaging 15 points over the last three games. At $3,000, you get 15 points and that enables me to fit in some of these other big-name players, and it probably works on a four-game slate when there's just no other great standing-out, balls-in-your-face type cheap guy that's going to be, this is the guy that we need to have. So Smith can fill that role. Don't feel great about it, but it is the Lakers, so big men can produce really excessive stats, um, unless they're Yusuf Nurkic. But Smith can put up some, uh, Smith can put up some numbers. He's, he's worth a look at in that sort of scenario, filling out a roster. Mark Heath is at 7,500, has been crushing it, but that is a big salary for Mark Heath, but he has been giving that value back almost every time he goes out into the court. At 6,800 on DraftKings, I, I love it even more. Fangel at 75, I'm not really heavily invested. The matchup does help him, and it's hard to shake the Mark Heath Morris stink, but he's done well enough for you to consider him a, as a cash option. I wouldn't be using Julius Randle if he returns. I don't think he's going to really have enough to run out a full game. And Larry Nance is just not getting enough playing time at the moment. At center, we've got Marching Gortat, who's at 6,700. Fine. 
centers crush the Lakers in general. He's at 6,000 on DraftKings. Really, really like that. I think Gortat's a guy you should absolutely be considering in both formats of the game. As for Zubats, he's averaging 28 points over the last three. And there's always like a caveat. Oh, this was a game where it was a blowout. This is a game that Randall was out. This is a game that Randall was limited eventually it just has to be start to become the norm for Zubats, but finding enough minutes for him is a tough decision. In the last game, he played 21 minutes, but Mozgov actually played more than him. And Mozgov put up 24 points in that playing time as well. So Zubats is good. You know I like Zubats a lot. I think if Randall is out, he would be worth looking at, but they've bumped him up a lot. He's at 4,700 on Fangio, and that that's almost that's taking a lot of the value away. On DraftKings, he's all right at 3900 No problem with using him over there. On that FanDuel price, that's taking a lot of the excitement, a lot of the value out of using Zubats at that price. Timmy Mozgov, 24 in the last game, 3700 Sure, if you're looking for a cheap center to take a punt on, go right ahead. And Tariq Black, even if he starts in place of Julius Randle, man, he just doesn't do anything. He can do something. He just doesn't. And he's he has started to look piss poor. He's, he's probably the best way I could say it over the last couple of games. All right, let's talk about the next one. We're going to talk about the Atlanta Hawks. They uh, got their asses kicked by the Miami Heat. They now travel to take on the Houston Rockets. The Rockets are favored by nine, and the total is 222. So another potential blowout situation. Tabo Cephalosha, at the moment, we've got him listed as doubtful because they said before the game, or the, the beat guy said, that it doesn't look like he's going to play. He's still struggling with his lateral movement. So with him out, that opens up some play for Kent Bazemore, and, uh, and Timmy Hardaway, the two main beneficiaries, the other players like Bembry or Prince, if he doesn't get suspended, uh, and Mike Dunleavy, just not going to do enough. Let's talk the point guards here. Pat Bev at 5,200 has really been struggling. He's averaging under 21 points over the last five, but playing against the Hawks is a good situation for point guards majority of the time. He's at 5,000 on DraftKings, which I think is a little bit better. And I could totally understand going for Beverly. I just don't have the faith in him in cash. I would look at it more as a as a tournament type play. Now, because Beverly's on the court, that really limits what Dennis Schroeder can do. He's at 6,700 and hasn't really been returning that sort of value recently anyway. And now he gets the matchup with uh, with Bev. So I think that Schroeder, to me, is a fade. I don't think he's a, he's a very good option here at all. Shooting guards. Well, Timmy Hardaway's at 4,900. That's a big price for Tim because he's just not consistent enough to give that price that's on Fangio fine in tournaments because he can go off and he should get an extra role here but we remember he's only playing he's only scoring 24 points a game over the last three and that's not really where it needs to be at 49 on DraftKings he's at 4200 so no problem you can use him at point guard as well over there he's got that extra eligibility he averages 24 points in the last five games which is fine at 4200 I think he's good value over there if we're assuming that Tabo Cephalosha uh, is out. Eric Gordon at 5,600 hasn't been producing, but this matchup is a good one. This is a fine time to get back on the Eric Gordon train. And on DraftKings at 51, it's even better. Jimmy Harden at 12,000. That's a $500 price drop because he was terrible against Sacramento. Just 27 points there. But we know what Jim can do. This matchup shouldn't be too much of a stressful one for him. 12-4 on DraftKings. I'm not quite as interested, but on FanDuel, yeah, totally fine if you're spending up and you've chucked some of those other cheap players in to uh, help you know, stretch out your roster a little bit. Small forwards, we've got Trev Ariza at 5,300. Like a lot of the Rockets, his production has been down recently, but this is an enticing matchup for Trev. 51 on DraftKings, no problem with going back to him. This is a game that I think is probably going to be the stackable one. There's a lot of targets in this game, and yes, there is blowout potential, but... As I said, there's blower potential in every game. Kent Bazemore also comes under consideration as a $5,000 player, assuming Tybo is out. At 5,300 on DraftKings, I feel very, very uninterested in him. But 5,000 on Fangio, there's definitely some uh, GPP upside for uh, for Bays. Sammy Decker's at 3,900. If you don't want to go Ubre, yeah, Decker's not a bad guy to take a look at as a cheap cheap wing player or cheap guy to fill out the roster. He can do that. And we've seen him have some big games, but it requires a few things to go right for that actually to occur for him. At power forward, Paul Millsap wasn't ideal today. He's at 8,500. Fine to go back to that well, I believe. 78 on DraftKings, I really like. That's a good price for Millsap. Um, but he's been not consistent this season and, and not great to be honest. He's been good, but not great at times. 
Ryan Anderson, we know what the story is with him. He is a GPP guy only. He is up to 5,900. So that's almost eliminating his GPP value, to be honest. Yeah, he had 44 in the last game. He's just as likely to have 12 in this game, though. So really be reluctant to consider him in any cash game format. If we look at Rhino on uh, DraftKings, he's at 5,200, so much more appealing. I would consider in cash if you're really struggling, but it's just not a move that I like to make. I do like Dwight Howard here, though. 7,100 for Dwight. He um, he played well the last time he took on Houston. He hasn't been playing his best recently, but I think this is a good matchup for him. So I'm okay with using Dwight. More than okay, I think Dwight's a really good option. He's at 6,900 on DraftKings. Giggity! Um, so really, yeah, one of the better mid-price centers that's available. Also, just want to give a, a quick shout-out to Ryan Naus over at Roto World, who wrote a great article today talking about revenge games. You've heard me talk about revenge games all the time and telling you that they're not true. He did a statistical analysis of it, and it shows you that it's not true. So go and have a read of that article by Ryan. Really good stuff over there. Yeah, even though it might be on a, a rival type website, I've got no. Ryan's a great bloke, and I've got no uh, no problem recommending a great article, especially when it backs up what I've been saying for a couple of years. Go and check it out. And uh, yeah, I've just never I've never actually put pen to paper in a metaphorical sense to to write it all out. But Ryan has done the heavy lifting, so go and have a read of that article, and he spells it out for you why revenge games don't exist. You can put it in with um, you can put that in with contract year players. That's another one of those myths. That, and there's another one that's in my head that I can't remember that doesn't exist. Oh, it'll come to me eventually. But contra- contract year players, uh, revenge games are, are definitely two things that are, are def- they are very um, confirmation biasy. When they happen, see, happens. And when it doesn't happen, nobody pays attention to it. The uh, the Rocket Centers, who knows what is going on? We can expect 21 or 22 minutes out of Clint Capella. That seems to be the case. He's at 4,900 on FanDuel, and he's at 47 on DraftKings. It's worth a look in case they increase his minutes, but I just have zero faith in these Hawks Centers, or sorry, these uh, Rocket Centers at all. I get the feeling that maybe we see Nene move back into a starting lineup against Dwight, and he would be an okay guy if he started, played 25 at 4,300. I could understand why you would use him. He's got the strength to take on Dwight, and on DraftKings where he's at 3,300, that is a great option. So if you hear that Nene is starting, on DraftKings at 3,300, that becomes my low-price, sneaky, let's take a flyer on it and see how it goes scenario. Montrez Harrell, the table. He's a 3,500 guy. I just don't think he's going to really be able to do much against uh, Dwight, and he might struggle to get in the game. All right, let's talk about the next game we've got on the slate. It is the Philadelphia 76ers. It's the San Antonio Spurs. The uh, Spurs are favored by 13.5, and and the total is 209.5. No Joel Embiid, and Bob Cove is questionable. Now, if Bob Cove is out, this is a blowout written all over it. If Bob Cove plays, the the Sixers should be able to keep it at least semi-close, but there's not a ton of fantasy value emanating from uh, from this clash. Let's talk point guards if I really have to. Tone Parker's at 4,500. He's got the upside, to be honest, Tone Parker, and that's a weird thing to say about Parker, but he has had these occasional weird games where he goes out and scores like 30, and at 4,500, there aren't many cheap point guards. In fact, there are no good cheap point guards on this slate. So if you want to go cheap at point guard, Tone Parker might be that guy. You could go Pat Mills, but he's done sweet FA recently, really. He had one game when uh, Parker was out that was decent, but otherwise, he's just not doing anything. He's averaging under 13 points over the last three so I wouldn't be counting on him to do much. TJ McConnell would sound like a good idea, but that price is just prohibitory. 5,900 for TJ on Fangio and 5,600 on DraftKings. I just find it tough for him to actually get to that level. Now on DraftKings, he's a better chance of it just based on the lower salary and the scoring system. I I just don't really feel it over on Fangio though. I just don't see that being uh, the situation that's uh, worth investigating. Danny Green's at 37. Manu's at 37. The chances that those guys, you know, smashing through value is pretty minimal. Obviously, they they can be they can happen, but it's just such a low opportunity. And with Bob Cove out, I would take a I'll take a look at Sauce Castillo. He is at 3700, um, and he could have a decent game, but relying upon it for cash is a is a pretty tough sell for me. Timotei Lawawu Cabrera, he had 13 points in his first NBA start. He's at 3500 dollars. If Bob Covey's out, would you take a punt on TLC? Maybe. I reckon you'd look at it more on DraftKings, where he's at 3,000. You want to go cheap wing, not Ubre, not Decker? 
3,000 for Lawawi Cabarro, that might work. That would be that would be a, a sneaky one. Probably not as not as high on my sneak rating as what Nene is, but it would be one that would be uh, be worth looking at. If Bobkov plays, he is at 6,400, but I actually feel pretty good about Covington being able to return at least close to that value. The Spurs matchup is discouraging, but so much of his stuff comes defensively and doesn't rely on him necessarily needing to be an absolute monster on offense. But 6,400 is a tough call, and we don't know his status, so it's really hard to commit to him being a player that we're going to be all over. As for Kawhi, he is at 10,100. The only thing holding him back from being a guy that I'm all over playing at that price is the blowout. On DraftKings, at 9,000, no problem. He should, even in a blowout, he should be able to get to 40 plus points and return value. 10,000 on Fangio, it's it's a much tougher sell for me to, to expend that much cash on a guy. Power forwards, Dave Lee is at 5,400. He's in this mid to low 20s range. The Production's not brilliant for him. We don't know if he goes back to starting, whether it's Deadman, whether it's Davis Bertans. We're going to see Lee in this 22, 24-minute role, and it's just going to be hard to get to 5,400. He's at 52 on DraftKings, and the same story that he just is too highly priced at the moment, and I'm not sure how high his upside is. The upside play you want to go for is Sharich. He's at 4,400. He can give us nothing, or he could give us 30. So that's that's the definition of a GPP type of player. There are two other power forwards that are worth looking at. LaMarcus Aldridge at 7,800. I have little faith in him returning that value in this game. Um, blowout factor is a concern, but if you want to spend up some money, he's the most reliable, I guess. While Ersan Ilyasova comes in at 5,700. The defense of the Spurs is quite impactful at power forward. It can be quite impactful, but I think that Ilyasova especially with Embiid out, is definitely worth a look. Get that extra usage. So I'm, I'm okay with using Illy. At 58 on DraftKings, I'm not quite as on board, but I still think that he can be a guy that I would probably consider using if I've got that cash to spend over a guy like Sharic. At center, Dwayne Dedman had a good game in the last one, but if he's not starting, he's a guy to ignore. And even if he is starting, he's not an absolute, let's automatically plug this guy in. Whereas Jali Okafor had just 18 points today in his 24 minutes at 4,700, not spending 47 on Jalil in a matchup against the... Uh, Against the Spurs, I didn't talk about Nerlens. Let's talk about him. He's at 6,200. That's why I didn't talk about him because that's ludicrous. He's at 6,000 on DraftKings. It's it's too much to spend for Nerlens Noel given the role that he's uh, currently in. Let's talk about the next game or the last game, the Golden State Warriors. They're taking on the Los Angeles Clippers. The Warriors are favored by 8.5 and, and the total is 224 points. Sean Livingston was out of today's game for the Warriors with a back issue. We don't know if he will be back. It doesn't really impact much. If he is out, Andre Iguodala, if the game is relatively close, will probably play some more minutes, and he becomes an interesting guy to take a look at. At point guard, uh, of course, we start with Steph Curry, who had a, an absolute monster today. He's at 9,600. He is really crushing it at the moment, and this matchup, I feel that he could be he could be worth a look if you don't want to go with say a John Wall. Steph could absolutely be worth a look at that sort of price given the given the current form that he is in at the moment. No problems considering him on DraftKings at 8700. He's a brilliant play. Really do like that over on DraftKings for Steph Curry. Austin Rivers at 5800. Eh, I'm not I'm not in love with it. It's fine. It's a decent mid-priced guy. It's not awesome. 6,400 on DraftKings, it's the opposite of awesome. I wouldn't want to be spending 6,400 on Austin, but if I can get him at 58, which I can on Fandrel, then he definitely enters the conversation. Ray Felton, who got some extra playing time today, he's at 4,600. I don't rely upon that fully, but he's he's worth a look. No doubt in my mind that you can have a look at him as a GPP. Clay Thompson's always a GPP. He's at 6,300, while JJ Redick at 47. I'm not really sure that this matchup's going to be uh, going to be brilliant for him, so not really interested in using JJ Redick. Jamal Crawford, I'll say the same thing. I just yeah, throw him in a GPP, but I don't have very much faith in them at all. Kevin Durant at 10,700, fine, love it. 10,300 on DraftKings. He's got a real chance to exceed 50. Every time he goes out there, whereas Andre Iguodala is at 4,400. Good matchup for him. And as I said, if Livingston is out, it really does work in his favor. He's at 4,000 on DraftKings as well. I actually like him on DraftKings uh, as a GPP play. I think there is some value in him given the way that he's been playing and with that possibility of, uh, of Shawnee sitting the game out. 
at power forward. Draymond is at 7,600. I like the I like the situation here for Draymond. A good matchup, a, a decent price. He's worth a look. He's at 81 on DraftKings. That doesn't really scare me away too much. Blake is at 7,700. Good game today from Blake. I'm just not sure that I'm ready to spend 7,700 on him, and I know for sure I'm not ready to spend 9,200 on him on Fangio. Not a that is a horrible investment and horrible pricing. At center, let's look at JaVale McGee, who's a minimum salary player. Yeah, he had the four blocks today. He's minimum on DraftKings as well. He's a, if you're looking for a cheap center, why not? Absolutely worth a look. You don't want to go that Jason Smith route that I mentioned before. 3,000 for JaVale. He gets some blocks. Why not? DeAndre Jordan at $8,000. He doesn't do that well against the Warriors. They can really limit his effectiveness. At 7,400 on DraftKings, I think it's okay. It's not great, but it's okay. He's definitely worth rostering there. But on Fangel at 8,000, I reckon uh, going in a different direction is probably going to suit you better. All right, let's wrap this podcast up now by talking about the picks of the day. We start off on Fangel. Tone Parker at 45, D'Angelo Russell at 61, and Johnny Wall at 10-8 at shooting guard. Tim Hardaway, 49. Brad Beal, 72, and Jimmy Harden at 12. At small forward, Kent Bazemore, 5,000. Trevor Ariza, 53, and Durant at 10-7. And the power forwards, Dario Saric, 44. Draymond Green at 76, and Paulie Millsap, 85. And at center, Clint Capella, 49, and Dwight Howard, 71. On DraftKings, Hardaway is at 42. Russell is at 57, and Johnny Walls at 10-4. Shooting guards, Ubre 34, Eric Gordon, 51, and Jim Harden, 12-4. At small forward, Iggy's at 4,000. Trevor Ariza? Eraser, Trevor Ariza at 5,100, the rubber, and Kawhi Leonard at 9,000. Power forward, Jason Smith, 3,000, LaMarcus Aldridge, 6,7, and Draymond, 8,1, and at center, JaVale McGee, 3,000, and Dwight Howard, 6,900. Let's go to the Aussies now. Moneyball, Tone Parker, 46, D'Angelo's at 6, and Johnny Walls at 10,2. At shooting guard, Timmy Hardaway at 47, Brattles Beal at 69, and Jimmy Harden at 12,5. Small forward, Kelly Oubre, 37. Trev Ariza, the rubber, 5,500. And Kevin Durant, 10,900. Jason Smith at 35. Draymond at 78. And Paul Millsap at 81. And at center, Nerlens Noel at 45. And Gortat at 66. Over on draft stars, Paddy Mills, 7,750. TJ McConnell, 9,350. And John Wall, 19,6. At shooting guard, Sauce Castillo's at 55. Austin Rivers, 92. And Jimmy Harden, 22,650. At small forward, Ubre's at 61, Ilya Sovers at 83, and Durant at 19.050. Power forward, Jason Smith, 5,000, Markeith at 12.9, and Draymond at 14.4. And at center, JaVale's at 5,000, Dwight Howard's at 13.7, and Paulie Millsap rounds it out at 15,200. We are done here, guys. Uh, follow me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball and subscribe to the podcast. Tell your friends. Leave a review and a ranking. It is all fantastic and it all helps uh, extremely much in getting the podcast out to more people. We are done here, guys. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Jared Sullinger.